So just as I did on Mother's Day, I like to preach sermons oftentimes when we have special days, holidays, things like that. So we'll be preaching a sermon on fathers and being a godly father this morning. And we start off here in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 2 with a, with a bad example. With an example of someone who wasn't a very good father with Eli. Eli was, was not a good example of a father because his sons turned out to be children of the devil. He raised reprobate sons. Look at verse number 12 there in 1 Samuel chapter 2. The Bible says, Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. You say, well, how can that be? I mean, Eli was a priest, right? He's in the priest's office. They're, they're, they're growing up in a Christian home, right? They're growing up to, to supposedly have to learn the Lord. Well, the failing is from Eli. At the end of the day, Eli fails them. Now, I want to preach on, on fatherhood and being a good father because at the end of the day, fathers, you know, you may not be spending the most time with your children. You know, God has designed it where the men are going to be working and the women are going to be staying at home. Moms are going to be raising the children while dad's at home. But you know what? The responsibility ends with you. As the head of the household, the father is ultimately responsible for everything that happens within your house. There is no excuse beyond you. So if mom isn't raising the children right, guess what, dad? That's your problem to deal with. That's something you have to correct. You can't just blame your wife on your children growing up wrong. You need to fix that. That is your job. That is your responsibility. And God has given a lot of responsibility. We'll get into that a little bit later on fathers. You know, when, when, when we talk about the different roles between women and men and, and, you know, husbands and wives, the world wants to make it look like, oh, man, every, you know, it's great to be the man and just the woman is just has this horrible job and she just has to cook and clean and raise kids and do all this stuff. It's like. What you don't understand is the level of responsibility that goes along with the leader, with the one that's in charge, with the one being the boss. Everything relies on the decisions that dad makes. So it's not just this great, glorious job. Hey, you're responsible. That's a big deal. I think it's kind of nice that God has allowed for the wife to not have that level of responsibility hanging over her head with everything else that she needs to do. That at the end of the day, though, dads, it ends with you. You need to make sure that your family is being run the way that you want it to be run. And there's no excuse. We're going to look at this example of Eli and we're going to look at a few things that he did wrong and where we should be, be wary of not to have it happen to us. Because I believe Eli was saved. I believe he was a man of God, but he just totally failed at being a father and his children went to the devil. So don't think that just because you bring your kids to church every week that they're going to grow up to be some great Christians. Don't think that just because you, you put them in and... and and just expose them to preaching that it's automatically going to happen. Because it's not. Not necessarily. You need to be involved. Dads need to be involved in their children's life. Let's take a look at this. Let's start reading here again in verse number 12. We just read this verse. Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. And the priest's custom with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant came with, while the flesh was in seething with a flesh hook of three teeth in his hand. And he struck it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the flesh hook brought up, the priest took for himself. So they did in Shiloh unto all the Israelites that came thither. Now, what we have to understand about the offerings that were made unto the Lord and the sacrifices that were made the way that God designed it, he already took care of the priests and the Levites that did the service. They already had portions that would be set aside for them. That was their part in the sacrifice for doing the labor, for doing the work of the Lord. God already in his law established 
This is what's going to be done. This is what you're going to get. But also when people made sacrifices, yes, sometimes there was like whole burnt sacrifices, but oftentimes the offering of sacrifices, the people who brought it would also partake. You'd come, you bring your family, you bring your sacrifice, you'd bring your offerings and you would be eating of the sacrifice that you gave. And that was something that, you know, that's the way that God designed it, that's the way he made it. But what these guys are doing is that they're coming while they're preparing their sacrifice, they're preparing the meat, it's in seething. They come and they're just like, well, no, we're taking this. And they would send their servants and just, no, we're taking this. And it got to the point, the Bible says, to where people despised coming in and giving their offering to the Lord because these two children of the devil were just coming in and just, no, we're going to take that and we're going to take it by force and there's nothing you can do about it and, and totally disregarding what they've already lawfully been given and just overstepping their bounds and just taking whatever they wanted. So it says here in uh, verse number 15, also before they burnt the fat, and of course the fat, like the fat's offered unto the Lord. It says, before they burned the fat, the priest's servant came and said to the man of sacrifice, give flesh to roast for the priest, for he will not have sodden flesh of thee, but raw. So they're just going to say, you're just going to give us the raw meat. Like, you haven't even prepared it yet. You have, you know, we haven't even removed the fat yet. And they're like, no, just, you're just giving that to the priest. And if any man said unto him, let them not fail to burn the fat presently, and then take as much as thy soul desireth, then he would answer him, nay, but thou shalt give it me now. And if not, I will take it by force. So they're trying to at least say, well, let, let's just do it right. Let me just finish cooking it. Let me just finish burning the fat and then go ahead and take some. And they're saying, no, give it to me now. Give it to me raw. And it says there in verse 17, wherefore the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. They made it so that people hated serving God, doing right by God, just by bringing in their sacrifice. People hated to do that. It's like people, I, man, I don't want to go to that church. I don't want to go and, and congregate together because we've got these children of the devil that are just screwing everything up. And it makes people hate church. You know, that's what happens when people, you know, when, when these sodomites and these children of the devil are allowed into churches, they end up defiling people. And then what happens? You meet these people and say, oh, and, it, you know, whether it's the person that gets defiled or just the fact that it happened in there, you've got people, I'm never going back to church again. They despise going to the house of the Lord. They despise it. They abhor it. Why? Because children of the devil were allowed to just be in service and allow all what, whatever to happen against, against the Lord. And, uh, and I've run into many people like that. Well, there's this scandal and this pastor and this guy and the youth pastor did this stuff. Man, I'm never going back to that again. It's wicked. And that's what's happening. But I don't want to get too far down that. I already got a little bit of, of that preaching yesterday. But um, I want to focus more on the father. You say, well, how could a dad let his children get to this point? Well, it starts when they're young. So, you know, unfortunately, when your children are already grown, there's really not a whole lot you can do. And we're going to see that also in this story. Because Eli tries to rebuke them, but they completely disregard what dad has to say. Why? Because they're already grown men at this point. You see, when, when you have a child, you mold and fashion them and teach them and train them when they're young. So that when they're old, they won't depart from their teaching, from their training. But you have to do it when they're young. Do it while there's still time before they just get set in their ways and it becomes too late for you as a parent to, um, to teach them and to train them. Do you look at verse number 22. The Bible says, Now Eli was very old and heard all that his sons did unto all Israel and how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So not only were they stealing the food, their covetous hearts were also fornicating with women at the at church. You know, people were coming to the tabernacle. They were just laying with these women, committing fornication. Verse 23, and it says, And he said unto them, Why do ye such things? For I hear of your evil dealings by all this people. Nay, my sons, for it is no good report that I hear. 
Ye make the Lord's people to transgress. They're supposed to be helping the Lord's people to do right, and they're making the Lord's people to sin. If one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? So he's trying to warn them and say, look, you know, when you sin against other people, there's going to be a judgment. But when, you, when you're sinning just directly against God, you're in God's office, and you're just sinning directly against God, he's like, who's going to entreat for you? Who's going to stand in the way? Notwithstanding, they hearkened not unto the voice of their father because the Lord would slay them. So they don't listen. They've already gone past the point of being able to receive instruction. The Bible says in verse 26, And the child Samuel grew on and was in favor both with the Lord and also with men. And there came a man of God unto Eli and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? So now a man of God is coming to Eli and is going to rebuke him for allowing his children to turn out the way that they did. Eli is the one that is getting blamed for his children. Read this. Look at verse 28. Because a man of God is speaking in the word of the Lord to him. And he starts being rebuked. Verse 28. And did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest to offer upon mine altar to burn incense to wear an ephod before me? And did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel? So saying, didn't I give all this to you? In the priest's office, you're getting these sacrifices made by fire. You're in this position. Didn't I give that to you and to your fathers? Verse 29, Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice and at mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and honorest thy sons above me, to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people." So what his sons were doing is they were taking, you know, the best sacrifices and things that were supposed to be unto the Lord and not unto them. And they're making themselves fat with it. I mean, they're just indulging. They're just going for and go, going at it. And he's saying the reason why he's saying you're honoring your sons above me is because he's not doing anything about it. And even when they're older, yeah, he rebuked them and said they're wrong. But you know what? Sometimes, Dad, you just got to get in there and stop it. If they're not going to listen to you, you step in and do something about it. You can't just stand back and just say, well, no, I'm just going to let... Especially when it comes to something like this. Right now, everyone's going to make choices in their life. Sometimes you may see your children making bad choices. You can't always stop them from going off and doing things. But under Eli's rule... Is Eli being the priest and his children serving in, in that function for the Lord? You better believe it was his duty and his responsibility to God to step in and say, this isn't going to happen anymore. And it's not just going to do it with words. And if you don't do it, I'm going to come down. I'm going to take that out of your hand. You're going to get out of here, you know, and just deal with the problem. And that's one of the jobs, one of the responsibilities of a father to say, no, I'm ruling this house. And this is the way things are going to be. Now, hopefully you could lead better to where things haven't already gotten that far out of control where your children are even doing, even thinking about doing those things. But at the end of the day, it's still Eli's responsibility saying, you respect your children more than me. Why? Because he's allowing the filth, the fornication, the stealing of the offerings to happen. He's heard about it and it still continues to happen. And he's not doing anything about it. Compare him to someone like Nehemiah who when he says, hey, you're not going to buy or sell on the Sabbath day, that, that we're actually going to honor the Sabbath and the, the merchants who are coming, he's saying, you're not going to come here anymore. And they say, yeah, yeah, whatever. And they show up. And he goes out there and says, no, you don't understand. You come here again, I'm going to lay hands on you. We're locking the gate. Get out of here and don't come back. That's the way that Nehemiah dealt with things. That's a godly man. That's a godly ruler, a godly leader. This is the way it needs to be in the house. And dad, that's your job. 
Verse number 30, Wherefore the Lord, of God, the Lord God of Israel saith, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord saith, Be it far from me. For them that honor me will I honor, I will honor, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days come that I will cut off thine arm and the arm of thy father's house, that there shall not be an old man in thine house. And thou shalt see an enemy in my habitation, in all the wealth which God shall give Israel. And there shall not be an old man in thine house forever. And the man of thine, whom I shall not cut off from, from mine altar, shall be to consume thine eyes, and to grieve thine heart, and all the increase of thine house shall die in the flower of their age. And this shall be a sign unto thee that shall come upon thy two sons, on Hophni and Phinehas. In one day they shall die, both of them. And I will raise me up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in mine heart and in my mind, and I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before mine anointed forever. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left in thine house shall come and crouch to him for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread, and shall say, Put me, I pray thee, into one of the priest's offices, that I may eat a piece of bread. This is a serious curse because it's a serious offense. I mean, this is a really big deal especially being in the position of a priest, being in the position of a servant of God and allowing all this stuff to happen. Man, you have ruined, he has allowed the ruin of so many people. They're abhorring serving the Lord. That's a big deal. Now again, I could preach all day on that subject in and of itself, just of men of God who are not doing what they're supposed to be doing and not running the church right, not running the things of God right and allowing for so many bad things to bring the name of the Lord, drag it through the mud, and cause all kinds of problems. But I want to focus more on Eli's failings as a father, because not only is he acting in, in priest, he's also a father to these children. The first thing that I want to point out about Eli here is, which he wasn't able to do, he was able to say things but not get involved. And as a dad, you need to learn how to say no. You need to be able to say no to your children and when they're young. And I don't care if you have all of the means in the world to give everything that your child asks you for. You know, oftentimes we have this conception of just thinking, man, I just want to give them everything. But you know what? That's actually not the best thing for your child. What you don't want to do is just allow your child to have everything that they want and never be told no and never have anything withheld from them. You don't want to feed a covetous heart or a covetous attitude where you just, well, I want this and I want this and I want this. The children of Eli, they had covetous hearts. They wanted what they couldn't have. They wanted other people's food, and dad let them get away with it. And then it didn't stop with the food, it didn't stop with the sacrifices. Then they're going to the women. Well, I want this woman, I want that And you know, They're not withholding anything from themselves. They're not learning to say no for themselves because they were never told no growing up. And if they were told no, nothing ever came of it when they did otherwise. But one of the things that the man of God said to Eli in verse 29, he said, to make yourselves fat. This wasn't, this was someone speak, this was a man of God speaking to Eli. So this was to Eli and to his children. He was included in the making yourselves. He didn't say making themselves. He said making yourselves, you and your children. Fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. Look at uh, chapter 4 and verse number 18. Chapter 4, verse 18, the Bible says, And it came to pass when he made mention of the ark of God. This, is, this was after, you know, there's this battle, and uh, his sons go off to war, and they take the ark, and, you know, they end up losing the fight because God's not with them. And uh, the Philistines take the, the Ark of God, you know, that's, that's taken from, uh, it, it's captured basically, they, they've, they've taken it. And Eli is hearing the report of what happened in the war. It says here, and when it came to pass, when he made mention of the Ark of God, that he fell from off the seat backward by the side of the gate 
and his neck break and he died. So as soon as he hears that the, the Ark of God was taken, he falls off his chair, cracks his neck, dies. It says, for he was an old man and heavy. And he had judged Israel 40 years. Heavy means he was fat. He had made himself fat. That was an area of life. He wasn't able to say no to the food. He wasn't able to say no. He had, he had a gluttonous heart and would not withhold this food from himself. And because of that, his children ended up having that same type of desire, except his children took it even further. And one thing you have to realize is that your children are going to see what you do and whatever sins you have and whatever it is that you're doing, they're going to end up seeing that. Most likely, they're going to end up doing that and doing even worse. The children always seem to take things one step further because you start to see, well, if it's okay for dad to do this, I mean, dad's doing it. Dad's the example. If dad's doing this, well, I'm going to do it too. We see David had multiple wives. David had seven wives or ten wives or however many wives he had. And then look at Solomon. Oh, well, if, I mean, if it's okay for dad to have a few extra wives, I might as well have 700. What's the difference? Just take it even further to the extreme. <coughs> and this is just a basic truth. You'll see this time and time again in households where you allow that little bit of sin in your house, in your life, and just condone it. Okay, and look, none of us are perfect, but you got to be aware and you definitely got to watch out for just what you're allowing to happen in your house. Because the kids will see that as being confirmed as, well, that's okay. And they'll also see some hypocrisy in you if you say and you do not. Oh, yeah, you shouldn't do this. And then you're doing it. The kids are going to see and learn from the example more than they're going to learn from just what's coming out of your mouth. You need to lead by example. Eli was a bad example of not being able to control his own appetite. And his children took it one step further. <coughs> your sins will affect your children. So we're going to start off. You want to be a good father. Work on yourself. First, focus on your life and getting sin out of your life and realizing that everything that you do is going to have an impact on your children. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 8. But in Exodus chapter 20, where, the, where God's giving us the Ten Commandments, in verse number 5, the Bible says, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them. Talking about building these, these, these molten images, these idols. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Fathers, yes, your sin can become upon your children because of what you do. Because of your sin, because of what you do. You go and start worshiping idols. Well, the Bible says that the iniquity of the fathers can be visited upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. If you love your children, you care about them, you better watch out what you're doing so you're not bringing judgment upon your whole family and your posterity to come. That's what happened to Eli. That curse that he received was not only to him, not only to his sons, but to the rest of his household for generations to come to where he's saying, you know what? The kids that aren't destroyed, the seed of your family that is going to remain, they're going to be begging for bread and just, uh, just please put me in any position. Give me a job, a priest. I just need to be able to eat. <coughs> That's a result of Eli's failings. A direct result of Eli's failings, his seed to come is going to receive that curse because of what he did. You say, I don't think that's fair. Well, that's what the Bible says. So watch what you do. If you care about your family, if you care about your children, you better make sure you keep yourself straight on the up and up. Look at John chapter 8. The Bible talks about, you know, we need to be examples 
for our children. As a father, your children are going to do what you do. They look up to you. They emulate you. Chap John chapter 8, verse 37, Jesus says, I know that you're Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. He's saying, we're both children of our father. Jesus, he's the only begotten son of God, right? His father is a father in heaven. He's saying, hey, everything that I see my dad doing, I see my father do, that's what I do. And I'm doing everything that my father wants me to do. He's saying, you're doing, and he's, of course, he's speaking to these Pharisees, you're doing the things of your father. And they're trying to claim, well, we're children of Abraham. And he's saying, no, you're not. Because if you're really a child of Abraham, then you're going to do what Abraham did. You're going to emulate Abraham. But you're used to him saying, that's not what you're doing. Because if Abraham were here, he wouldn't be hating me. He wouldn't be trying to kill me. Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He tells him later. Look at verse number 38. He says, I, or verse number 39. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto them, if ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. And it goes on and on. We're going to read the rest of the chapter. But um, the real reason that they acted the way they were is because they were of their father, the devil. They may have claimed to be children of Abraham, but they weren't. They weren't real children of Abraham. But the point that we see here, the truth that's being expressed here, is that children are children of their parents because they end up so many times, time after time, they're going to emulate what you do. You're the one who's giving them the teaching and training. You are their life growing up from a child coming up. They're going to mimic what you do because you are the pattern for their life. That's what becomes normal in their mind. How they live, how they grow up, what they see. So children that only see fighting and all kinds of chaos and everything happening in their home life, just growing up day after day after day after day after day, and that's what they live with, they might start to think that that's normal. And then when they grow up, guess what's going to happen? They're going to begin in fight after fight after fight after fight after fight with their spouse. Why? Because that's what they're used to. That's what they've grown up with. That's what's normal to them. I know of someone that was abused as a child from their own parent. Horrible situation. Unfathomable. But if that's what you grew up, this person said, I didn't know any different. It's not that they enjoyed it or liked it or anything, but it's just, you just think that that's what happens because that's what's happened to you. And if that's something that happens for an extended period of time as a child from a child just growing up, you just start to think that that's normal. There's huge impact that you have as parents on your children and in fashioning and molding what is normal for them. And it's based way more on what you do than what you say. Abraham was a very good example in the scripture of being a father. He, that's why he's known as the father of faith. And, and people are constantly referred to as, you know, children of Abraham. And we are children of Abraham through faith in Jesus Christ. He is a good example. In Genesis 18, you don't have to turn there. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 31. But in Genesis 18, verse 19, this is the Lord speaking of Abraham. So in Genesis 18, of course, this is when the two angels... And the Lord show up to, to commune with Abraham before they go into Sodom and they're going to you know, get Lot out of there and destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. But in, in Genesis 18, God's kind of debating whether or not he should tell Abraham what's going to happen. And it says in verse 19, For I know him, I know Abraham, I know him that he will command his children 
and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. He said, I know Abraham. What's Abraham going to do? I know that he's going to command his children because that's a father's job. Command your children. You need to tell them what to do. You need to give them instructions. You need to give them commandments. You can't just let them figure everything out on their own. No, command them. Instruct them in the way that's right. Tell them what they need to be doing. Take the, yeah, you know what? It takes time to do that. I know you might be tired from working all day, but do you love your family? Do you love your children? You need to spend time with them. You need to tell them. The Bible says in Deuteronomy, I think it's chapter 4, where it's talking about, you know, about the law, about God's law. These things, you know, you need to be talking about in the way with them when you wake up in the morning, when you go to bed at night. Just, just all the time, you need to be teaching your children the ways of God. This is work. You need to train your children. God knew that Abraham was going to command his children and his household. He's going to do what's right. He's going to be a good leader. And that's why God said, that's why I'm going to be able to bless them and do everything that I already said I was going to do. Because I know him. Because he's going to do what's right. He's going to raise his family right. You need to keep yourself pure. You have a great responsibility to your family, fathers. You need to be able to lead your wife and your children physically, spiritually, emotionally, everything. You are the center of that family, physically speaking, with God being at the head. I'd had you turn to Proverbs 31 too, because one of the important aspects of being a good father is that you are filling the role that God gave you to be in charge, to be the ruler of the house. And in order to be the head of the house, and in order to, uh, to do things the way that God has outlined in the Bible, you can't just give your strength unto your wife and allow her to run everything where you put her in charge instead of you. The Bible says in Proverbs 31, verse 2, which, by the way, is, is coming from a woman. Just, just keep this in mind. Obviously, it's the word of God, but this is coming from a woman. Verse 2, what my son and what the son of my womb and what the son of my vows. This is a mother teaching her child. Verse 3, give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. This is a teaching that the children need to hear. She's teaching her son. Don't give your strength unto women. Maintain your strength. Maintain your authority. Don't give up your authority to them at home and just let them just be in charge because that's not what God has them to do. That's your job. You can't give your job to someone else. Just like the wife can't give her job to you. And now you have to do all the stuff that your wife's supposed to be doing. Don't do that. God made it this way for a reason. The Bible says in Ephesians, turn if you would to Numbers chapter 30. I'm going to read Ephesians 5, very, very uh, common passage when it comes to husbands and wives. The Bible says in Ephesians 5, 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Verse 27 is what I want to focus on, though, because the, the commandment for the husbands is to love your wife. And absolutely, love your wife. You're in charge, you're ruling the house, but you're ruling it with love because you love your children, you love your wife. But one of the ways that you are going to rule in the lead, just as Jesus Christ, it says in verse 27, that he might present it to himself a glorious church because it's equating Jesus and the church with a husband and his wife. Jesus Christ wants to present the church a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. So Jesus wants to get, you know, shape the church upright and, and get the spot. What would be a spot or a wrinkle? Well, areas where you're doing things wrong, areas where you're sinning, areas where you need to fix this. Jesus is going to have that type of relationship trying to fix the church. Saying, you know what? Yeah, you know, I love my church, but I, the church can be 
better. So I want to make sure there's no spots, no wrinkles, and that, and that the church looks great, that it's glorious. Well, the husband has the role with his wife. You love your wife, but you need to help your wife to be a glorious wife, not having the spot or wrinkle and be able to identify areas and obviously do so tactfully in a loving way, but still be able to, to, to lead and say, this is what we need to do. And sometimes, men, in your house, you need to say, this is going to go. And especially if it's something that's just flat out against the word of God in your house, if your wife likes idolatry and she decides she's going to put up some idols in your house. Well, guess what, Dad? If you don't want to be like Eli, where God's going to say, hey, you honor your wife more than you honor me, you know what you need to do is saying, no, this isn't going to be in our household. Unacceptable. It's going in the trash right now. We're going to stamp it in the Brook Kydron, and I'm going to make you eat it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just throw it away, all right? You can at least just throw it away. We're not by the Brook Kydron. But... You know what I'm saying, okay? When there's areas like that, when there's something just like, this is, this is just completely against God's word, this, we're not going to stand for this at all. And look, I, I've been there. I've done that in our household. Things that needed to be done. And you know what? Sometimes as dad, you need to, to go through again and again and just make sure the stuff isn't creeping in. Regardless of who brings it in, keep an eye on the household. Keep an eye that everything is, that, that your, your household can be glorious. But what I really want to stress, and I want men not to forget this, the authority that you have in your home. I had you turn to Numbers chapter 30. Because God has given you a lot of responsibility. You are responsible. Numbers chapter 30, verse number 1, the Bible says, And Moses spake unto the heads of the tribes concerning the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. If a man vow a vow unto the Lord, or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. Amen. You make a vow, you keep the vow, men. That's your job. Verse number three, if a woman also vow a vow unto the Lord and bind herself by a bond, being in her father's house in her youth, so now this is referring to fathers who have daughters that are younger and they're staying in dad's house. Guess who's in charge of that house? Dad is. This is talking about a daughter that's making a vow unto God. And the reason why I bring this up, I preached on this passage before, but I think it's very important to understand the amount of authority that God has given to the father of the household because even something as personal as a vow between you and God, I mean, it doesn't really get much more personal than that and just saying, my direct, God, I'm making a vow unto you. If you're a daughter in your father's house, the Bible says, dad has the ability to nullify that and say, nope, nope, that vow isn't going to stand. That's a high level of authority given by God. And you know what? God will respect what the dad says. If dad says, nope, it's not going to stand, then God says, okay, it's not going to stand. God has deferred that, that level of authority to the father in the household. Let's just read it. Verse number four. It says, and her father hear the vow. So if she vows, her dad hears it, and her bond wherewith she hath bound her soul, and her father shall hold his peace at her. So if dad says nothing, then all her vows shall stand, and every bond wherewith she hath bound her soul shall stand. But if her father disallow her in the day that he heareth, not any of her vows or of her bonds wherewith she hath bound her soul shall stand. And the Lord shall forgive her because her father disallowed her. Two things I want to point out. One is just God says, hey, if dad disallows it, then it's no good. It's null. It's void. God will forgive you. You didn't do anything wrong. Dad said no, and that's where it stands. But also, it makes a point to say, hey, if dad, if dad holds his peace, if dad doesn't say anything, dad knows about it. Dad hears about it. Dad doesn't say anything. Dad, you are affirming. That is putting your stamp of approval on things when you say nothing. 
When you know about something and say nothing, you might as well say yes. The reason why I really want to make that drive that home is because I think sometimes things happen at home and dad knows they're wrong and dad knows they shouldn't be done. But because it's just easier to look the other way and not deal with it and not cause a confrontation and not cause a fight and just, yeah, I don't really want to deal with that right now. You're not doing the right thing. And what you end up doing is you're going to, one, you're going to send mis me mist mixed messages. Because if you don't believe that's right and you're not saying anything about it and you're just going to let allow that to go on in your house. Hey, I mean, the Bible says you're affirming. You're just putting your stamp of approval on it. And then you want to come back later and say, oh, wait, that's not right. Don't do those things. They're going to treat you like a joke, like Eli's sons. Eli needed to be telling his sons early on, no, 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 withhold it. Eli himself needed to be withholding himself and showing the example of being disciplined and, and being able to withhold from yourself as opposed to just giving them the bad example and then when they do things wrong, not saying and not doing anything about it until it's way too late. And then you're going to say, oh, yeah, don't do that. Well, it's a little late now, Dad. And if they don't stop with what you say, which they should, they should stop. They should have that level of respect for you and for your authority in the household. If they don't, that's why it may be necessary to discipline and to chasten your children. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 3, verse number 11, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. If you love your children, because that's what it's saying. The father, they say, well, why would a, why would a father ch correct or chastise, chasten the son whom he's delighting in? Well, he delights in him. It means he loves him. So because you love him, you're going to correct him. You're going you're gonna to show him that there are consequences for your actions. And again, that is not fun to do. I don't know of anyone that just really enjoys meeting out a punishment on your children. It's not pleasant for anyone. There tends to be a lot of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And it tends to put people in a bad mood. And, but you know what? It's necessary. If you love your children, you're going to show them this is the way you do it. And you know what, though, dads, this is talking about a father correcting his son. Because we know that God will correct us. So fathers, you need to be disciplining your children. You have to do it. Don't just leave that to your wife to do the disciplining you get involved and do the discipline also. And you know what? I'm sick of, of households where it's completely unbalanced one way or the other, where it's only dad doing the disciplining or only mom doing the disciplining. They need it from both. Because I'll tell you what, the parent that doesn't spank their children is the one who doesn't get respected. Because what you need to do, and dad, you're responsible for this. So if, you're, if your wife is not Disciplining your children the way you're supposed to be, that's a problem that you need to correct. Because you need to make sure that your children respect their mom. Not just you, their mom too. And the only way that that's going to happen is mom needs to be correcting the children. Needs to happen. Why? Because sinful human nature. Just because you say no to someone, if there's no consequences for it, if there was no if there's a law and no consequences, why would anyone follow the law? I mean, you may or may not. If you can just do whatever, if people can steal, well, there's no punishment for stealing. Yeah, we have a law against it, but there's just no punishment for it. Then, then why even have the law? It's, it's meaningless. It's useless. And if you have a law at home and there's nothing to back that up, your kids will figure that out right away and be able to go, okay, yeah, 
You said not to do that, but I want to do it anyways. And I'm going to do it, and what are you going to do? That's why you have to have punishment. That's why you have to have correction and say, no, this isn't going to happen. And dad, the buck stops with you. If things aren't happening in your household the way it needs to be, then you need to do it. If, if, you're only, if your wife's the only one correct, because look, the wife should be spending way more time with the children than the dad is because dad's going to be off at work. So just by virtue of how much time they spend, I think wives should be the ones correcting them more. But dad needs to be involved too because dad can't just be the guy that, oh, well, we're going to go to dad because dad's a nice guy and dad won't correct us and mom's the mean one. You ought not to have a mean one that, that does the correction where the kids think that they could run and hide to this person because they're not going to spank me, whereas this mean person will. That's imbalanced. Yeah. And that's not right. And that's not, that's not right for either spouse to, to be in a position of being the bad person. Dads, if that's not right in your home, get it right. But it's not just about discipline. It's not just about ruling. You have to spend time with your children. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2. We're almost done. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 3 verse 21, Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Part of training your child Yes, there needs to be rules. Yes, you need to rule your house well. Yes, there needs to be discipline. But you don't want your children just being beaten down and discouraged, thinking they can't do anything right. You know, don't, don't do that to your children. They need to be encouraged. They need to be edified. They need to be loved. They need to have time spent with them. They need to be shown the right way, not just because they're doing everything wrong. You don't want your child to just, well, everything I do is just always wrong. And that's the only time dad gets involved is because I'm just always doing everything wrong. That won't help your child either. First Thessalonians chapter 2, look at verse number 10. The Bible says, Ye are witnesses in God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. So he's, first of all, he's saying, what's he referring to? The good example that he was to them. Because spiritually speaking, the apostle Paul and these other disciples, they were spiritual fathers of the people because they led them to Christ. So he's saying, you know how we gave the good example. We were holy. We were just. We were unblameable. We behaved ourselves this way among you. Verse 11, as you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. That's the way a father should be with his children. A father should be able to exhort. What does it mean to exhort? You're encouraging, right? You're, you're, you're giving them some hope. You're exhorting them. You're lifting them up. You're building them up. You're helping them out. You're comforting them. Providing, providing support, strength. You can do this, son. This is, and then, and charge them. This is how you do it. Lead them. Build them up. Help them. Yes, correct them when they're wrong. But give them the time, the love, the energy, the effort to show them the right way. That is how you need to be as a father. Verse 12, that ye would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. You want your child to follow God? You want them to turn out right, not to go to the devil? Have a balanced life with your children. Take your responsibility seriously. Teach them, instruct them, comfort them, discipline them. Say no to them. Don't just be their friend. Be their father. And teach them wisdom. The whole book of Proverbs, you read through. I'm just going to read uh, from chapter 1, verse 8. My son, hear the instruction of thy father. There's an entire book of the Bible that's essentially as a father instructing his son. Son. 
This is in, in the book of Proverbs, all very applicable, very good life, just real straightforward life lessons. Son, watch out for the wicked woman. Watch out for these women that do these things. Watch out for the guys that are going to try to get you into doing all kinds of stuff and stealing and, and going that way. Watch out for that. Watch out for fornication. Watch out for drinking. Watch out for these things. Watch out for the wicked people of the world. Instruction, wisdom, taking the time. My son, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. And you'll see that repeated over and over and over and over again through the book of Proverbs. You know what that tells me, dads? Get a part in instructing your children. Don't just rely on other people to teach your children. Don't think that because they come in the church that they're going to receive all the instruction that they need because they're hearing some pastor behind a pulpit preach. You don't even know if they're listening. Who knows what's going on in their minds? But you know what you do know when you sit down and you have a conversation with your family then you know if they're listening because why? You could ask them questions. You can engage in conversation. You could help them to understand things that they don't understand. You can't just sit them down and just be like, okay, listen to that and walk away and be done with it. There's more to it than that. A lot more to it than that. Take the time. It's worth it. You know what? This world is not about money. It's not about how comfortable you can be. It's about people. It's about relationships. Hey, have a good family life and worry about them and worry about other people, other souls. Bring people. That's what it's about. Don't waste your time distracted with everything else. Invest in your children. Invest in your family. Invest in your wife and do the work of God. But dads, in order to teach, you need to know. You need to know for yourself. You can't teach things you don't know. Again, the level of responsibility. You're the teacher. You're the head. You're the ruler. Well, if you're going to do a good job, you need to know. If you're going to teach your children wisdom, why don't you get wisdom? Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Start with that. Hopefully you already have that. Then keep going down. Learn to pay. Instruct your children to read their Bible. But you know what, Dad? You ought to be reading more than they do. Instruct your wife to read her Bible. You ought to be doing more. You need to be the spiritual leader of the house. You need to be the financial leader of the house. You need to be that strength for your family. That's your job. Be strong. Be strong in your faith. Be strong. Your children are going to be relying on you. Your wife is going to be relying on you. Last verse, I'll just read this for you. Philippians 2.22. Maybe you are spending time. Maybe you are teaching your children. Great. Amen. I hope you're doing all that. Philippians 2.22 will tell us you also need to teach your children to love other people and to win souls to Christ. Philippians 2.22 says, But ye know the proof of him that... As a son with the Father, he hath served with me in the gospel. So this is, again, Apostle Paul referring to someone else being his spiritual son. But he says, as a son with the Father, he served with me in the gospel, implying that a father and a son, son should be serving with dad in the gospel. Dad, make sure you're able to, to win people, lead people to Christ. Take your son with you. Bring them with to labor with you. Teach them how to do it. Teach them by example. Everything you do, your children are going to be looking at. They'll be watching you closely. They live with you. They'll be learning after your ways. Clean up yourself. Don't be the hypocrite. Like Matthew 7 is talking about the guy that's got the big old beam in his eye trying to, to help the person who has a moat in their eye. If you have just made your sin in your life, get, get rid of that. Get that out so that you can teach your children without being a hypocrite, without just being, having this big old beam in your eye that they're not even going to want to listen to anything you have to say anyways because you're like, oh, who, you know, who are you to judge? Who are you to tell me what's right and wrong when you're doing this and that? Don't be the bad example. Get that right. Take charge. Use 
the authority God's given you the way that God wants you to use it. Take that control. That's your job. Treat it with great respect, the responsibility that you have. And you know what? Dedicate and focus your time on it. I thank God for all the fathers that, that look to God for his instruction and that are, are looking to raise godly families and godly children so that the next generation will have people that can continue to do the works of their father. And hopefully we're all learning to do the works of our father in heaven. As far as I have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for all the wisdom that we can receive from your words. Lord, I pray that you would please just help this to sink home um, into our ears, into our minds, into our hearts, Lord. Help us to improve. Everybody can improve, Lord. I can improve. Help us all to be able to improve in the areas where, where we're struggling with the most. God, help the fathers to, to just become better fathers for their children. Lord, I pray that you would please just help uh, us in this generation to live godly examples and just be a light that could shine in the world through, uh, through our actions, through what we do, um, out of respect for your word. And Lord, I pray that you will please just, just help us to identify the areas that need fixing and give us the strength to, uh, to correct them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.